Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Again, if you need the notes already or didn't get them coming in, make sure that you hold up your hand. The men are ready to serve you with those. It's good to see Jenny with us tonight. And it's, it's, it's hard to recognize people uh, with these masks on. It's, uh, it's tough. It's good to see her with us tonight. Matthew chapter 8. If you want to, you can mark Luke 7 also. Matthew 8 and Luke 7. We're going to be concentrating on Matthew chapter 8. Looking tonight at so great faith, or building a so great faith. In Matthew chapter 8, and in verse, we'll begin in verse number 5. Matthew 8, verse number 5. Watch for that little phrase, so great faith, when we look tonight at, but we need to be people of faith. We need to grow in our faith. We need, if anybody, if any time our nation needed God's people to be people of faith, it is now, and we are so, so lacking. So, Matthew chapter 8, verse number 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Father, we ask you to help us tonight. Lord, help us just glean just some simple thoughts and reminders and encouragements that we would seek to have so great faith. But Lord, that's something we cannot do in ourselves. It's something you have to do in us. So, Lord, I pray that we'd be open and receptive to it. Help us learn tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Lord, we ask that you keep distractions away tonight with the noise and the traffic and the things that go on around us. We'd focus for just a few moments on your word. Lord, so meet with us as you promised. Lord, help me grow in my faith. Lord, even as I studied today this passage, I have to confess my lack of faith. I have to confess my lack of growing in faith. Lord, I commit to you to help you, to have you to help me to grow in my faith. That Yes, I could too also have so great faith. Help us, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. In Luke 7 and Matthew 8, we have two appears to be the same events, but two different accounts of it. And just like in the Christmas story, if you're going to understand the full Christmas story, you can't read just Luke, you can't read just John, you have to look at all of them and put them all together. Same thing with the Easter story. To get the resurrection morning story, you have to go through all the Gospels and you put them together and it works uh, just fine. So same it is with Luke chapter 7 and verse number 8, or ch Matthew 8. Yeah, sometimes, if you look at that, some people would say there's a contradiction in the Bible. By the way, there are no contradictions in the Bible. What we find is if we something that appears to be a contradiction, it's really our lack of understanding, our misunderstanding of it. So let me just give, take just a few moments and help you understand, because somebody may came to you, come to you and say, well, there's a contradiction. Luke 7 and Matthew 8, same story, same, appears to be the same event, but they seem to tell a different story. And let, help, us, help me help you understand with that. For example, in Luke 7, it says that this centurion sent his messengers, sent his ambassadors, and here in Matthew, it says he came. Now, to us understand that, we need to know that ambassadors are directly, or the work of ambassadors are directly attributed to those in charge. An ambassador will say that. Well, let me give you for an example. Let's say I called Brother Treber, or I emailed Brother Treber. Well, you can't email Brother Treble. But if you email Brother Treber, his wife gets it because he doesn't do emails. And so you send an email to Brother Treber and say, Brother Treber, I'd like you to come preach for us in January. And so his wife gets that email, then gives it to Brother Treber, and that's their meeting. He talks about it. He says, well, tell Brother Bryson I'll get back to him. And so, and so she emails me with his email saying he's going to get back to me. Then you come to me and says, is Brother Treber coming in January? And I'll tell you, he told me he'd get back to me. 
Brother Treber did not tell me he'd get back to me, but he did tell me he'd get back to me. Do you follow what I'm saying? That's that direct contribution. Yeah. So let's say then Miss he, Brother Treber tells Mrs. Treber, yes, I'll go a certain day uh, meeting in January with Brother Bryson. So she calls Mrs. Chan and tells Mrs. Chan, Brother Treber says he'll definitely be there on this time. Mrs. Chan then emails me and says, Brother Treber's going to be there definitely at this time. You come to me and says, have you heard from Brother Treber? Yes, Brother Treber says he'll definitely be here. But he did not tell me that. But it was attributed to him because that was his people giving the same report. So it is with Luke and Matthew in this case. We have this centurion who's over up. He's an influential man. And so as he would send, he was saying. As he would send, he directed. As he would send, he would do that. And so it's the same way. Uh, in Scripture, we find that God tells us basically the same way. Luke, being a doctor, being very detailed, as God would reveal to him, or as God would have him then relate it, more detailed. Matthew, being the tax collector, a little more general. But we find, for example, in Matthew uh, 27, 59, again, this is just kind of by the way, as people would talk to you, to so help you understand and be able to explain, if somebody said, well, I read this, and that shows there's contradiction. No, it means we just didn't understand it. In Matthew 7, 59, and it says, and when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth. Remember, Joseph Pharmathia, a very rich man, laid it down in his own new tomb, which he had hewn out of the rock, and he rolled a great stone on the door of it. So that says that Joseph then had hewn out of the rock his tomb. I doubt if that rich man picked up a pick. But we say he hewed it out. Why? Because he had it done. Why? Because he commanded it. Why? He says, I'm having it done. But he himself had not done it. Same thing with Pilate. And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. So there it says Pilate had scourged him. I doubt if Pilate picked up the whip. He had his soldiers scourge him. So it was attributed to him. Same thing uh, with Elijah. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let none of them escape. And they took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishron, and slew them there. I doubt if Elijah slew all 450 prophets. He may not have killed them. But he says, let's go down, and he killed them. So that action, those words, those deeds, were attributed directly to the one in charge. Same thing we have in our workplaces today, same thing we have in the churches. And so Matthew kind of giving an overview, Luke giving the very specific. And so it's not contradiction. It's just a different perspective, different understanding of the same two stories. So you look at both of them to get that. So that's just a, an old by the way. So we're looking at our story here in Matthew chapter 8. And we have a great lesson on so great faith. So, not just a good bit of faith. Not just some nice faith. But so great faith. Again, if you look at that, verse number 10, And when Jesus heard it, he marveled, and said unto them that followed, Verily say unto you, I have not found so great faith. So, just like when God can't figure out how to help us understand how big something is, he says it's so. In other words, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. And he said, I can't express it so much. It's just like a little child. Uh, how, much, how much do you love me? So much. And so here Jesus is marveled at the fact that he had so great faith. But I want you to notice, Jesus marveled at it. He was amazed at it. He admired it. He, again, verse number 10, he marveled and said unto them that followed. He marveled at so great faith. Didn't mean he didn't know he had it. He knew it was going to happen. But he was just, even as he knew it was happening and knew it was going to happen, he said, boy, that's just amazing. That's just amazing. There's only one other place where Jesus marveled. Here we have him marveling at so great a faith. But we find he also marveled at lack of faith. It says in Mark chapter 6, verse number 5, And he could there do no mighty works, save he laid his hands upon a few folk, folk, few sick folk and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. So Jesus marveled in one case at so great a faith, an amazing faith, a man acting out of great faith. And then he also marveled, as was amazed, if you will, at a lack of faith. And I began thinking about that. If Jesus was writing the book still today, what could he say? Does he ever marvel at me? Does he ever, what, is, what would he marvel at in your life? What would he marvel at in my life? Would he marvel at our great faith? Or would he marvel at our unbelief? Would he marvel at our faithfulness? Or would he marvel at our unfaithfulness? 
Would he marvel at our dedication or our indecision? Would he marvel at our love or our lukewarmness? Would he marvel at our service or at our sloth? What do you say? You've got the entire Bible. You've got these passages. You've got the whole that. You've got the Holy Spirit living inside of you, and yet we do not grow, and yet we do not live as we should. I think He would marvel at us. My desire is that God would look at us in our lives, and not for our glory, but for His. That He would also marvel at so great faith in our life. My desire for Lighthouse Baptist Church is God would marvel at so great faith of Lighthouse Baptist Church. So tonight we're going to take just a few minutes, just glean a few things from this centurion about how we might be able to build, how we might be able to establish and have so great faith. You know, if you've been saved many years, you say, "Oh, I know all about faith." Well, we need to grow in our faith. We may know about it, but do we have it? So let's learn to develop so great faith. Number one, here we go tonight, very simple thoughts, but a great help for us if we can get the desire to have so great faith. Number one, so great faith is personal faith. It's personal faith. Here he marveled at this man's faith. He didn't marvel at the Gentile faith. He didn't marvel at, his, at the group's faith. He marveled at this man's faith. It's personal. But we need to get personal. We need to get back to being personal in our relationship with God. We need to get back to being very personal in our religion. You know, so often we get to the place where we just kind of... Well, back in the days where you went to a stadium for a ball game, and you were in the crowd with thousands and thousands of people, and you looked there, it's just a maze of people. Just a wall of people when you see them there in the stands. And you get there and you felt like you were just one in a maze, just one in a wall of people. I'm afraid if we're not careful in our church and in our relationship with God and in our Christianity, we kind of just want to sink back into the crowd. We just want to kind of sit back into the wall of people and say, are we okay? As long as I'm not too bad worse than these folks, I'm okay and just in the crowd. Ladies and gentlemen, God looks at us individually. He looks at our faith individually, and we must get back to where it's personal in our relationship. We want to have that old song. Relax, I'm not going to sing. But it says, it's me, it's me. Oh, Lord, stand in the need of prayer. It's me. We've got to get back to that personal thing. So he said, I've never seen so great faith, not in, a, in, a, in an army, not in a church, but he said, in this man. So we need to be people of prayer, me. People of soul winning, me. People of separation, me. People of holiness, me. This great faith. So if you and I are going to have so great faith, it's all going to be personal. We can't look around and say, how are we? No, it's how am I doing? So we find, very simply, first of all, number one, so great faith is personal faith. Personal faith. Oh, let's have a desire to grow and have God examine us and help us grow and build in our personal, personal faith. Now, I'm glad we have a church. I'm glad we as a church need to, as a church, have so great faith and grow in faith and be a church of great faith. But we'll only be a church of great faith if you and I are people of great faith because so we are the church. And so we need to be part of a church that builds and encourages. But just like everything else in our Christian life, we must be able or must have a desire to say, as for me. I preached a whole series on as for me. How's my faith? If everybody else's faith dies off, Lord, please build my faith. If everybody else becomes faithless, Lord, help me be faithful, personal. So we find this individual, he was not part of the Jewish community. He was a centurion. He was a Gentile. He was a Roman. He was a, But he by himself had so great faith. He wasn't part of the Jewish nation. He wasn't part of the disciples group there. No, but in his life, Jesus said, I've never seen so great faith. So his so great faith is personal personal faith. Let's check our faith tonight. In our prayer time tomorrow, say, God, how's my faith? Help me grow in my faith. Number two, see how fast we're going. It's not just so great faith is personal. Number two, so great faith is produced. It's produced. In other words, I'm not born with it. It doesn't just happen to us. I'm afraid sometimes as Christians, Many Christians, they're waiting for God to douse them with faith. 
But it's a produced. It's something that we're not born with, but it's produced in us and can grow. You say, well, God just didn't give me much faith. Well, grow in faith. Well, I just don't have much faith. Well, let's grow in faith. It's something that's produced. In 2 Thessalonians 1.3, I believe it's in your notes, he said, we are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly. He said, I thank God that your faith is growing exceedingly. It went from small to something bigger to something more to just exceeding growth in faith. Boy, I began to think about that and say, God, I want my faith in this year, over these next 12 months, to grow exceedingly. I hope that's your prayer. I hope you'll put that on your prayer list. God, help my growth faith grow exceedingly. In Luke 17, 5, And the apostle said unto him, said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. They said, well, faith is not, our faith is not where it needs to be. Lord, increase it. In Mark 9, 24, And straightway the father and child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. He's in other words, he says, I believe some, but not enough. I believe some, but I want to believe more. I've got some faith, but I want more. Let's desire and let's set our, scale, our, our, our scope, set our target, set our aim that God would begin to help us grow exceedingly in faith. So Jesus saw this centurion, saw this Gentile, this non-Jew, and he said, boy, I've never seen so great faith. Very quickly, how is it produced? It's produced by hearing. If you've been saved very long, you know that verse. But in Luke 7, verse number 3, it says, well, if you want to flip back there, it says, When he heard, in, the, in Luke 7 account, it says, And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto the elders of the Jews, beseeching him they would come and heal his servant. When he heard, when he heard, boy, I tell you what, we have our faith increased or produced by hearing. Romans 10, 17, we hear that preached all the time. So then faith cometh by what class? Hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So it's hearing. That's why we need to hear more all the time. That's why you need to have the right music playing so you can hear all the time. That's why we need to be in the Bible every day so we can hear all the time. That's why you need to be in church services Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Monday and Tuesday nights when there's special meetings so we can hear. It's so vital that we hear. Listen, the more we hear, the more our faith grows. The more we hear about Jesus, His power, His love, His glory, His coming, the more we hear it, the more our faith grows. And the less we hear, our faith decreases. If you've been slave, saved very long, then you've no doubt backslidden a few times. And the less you hear, the less your faith is. That's why when you get teenagers and they go to camp, I mean, the first couple of days is pretty rough, but by the end of the week where they've heard preaching three times in the morning, three times in the afternoon, some in the evening, yeah, they've had all sorts of crazy games, but they've heard preaching and they've sung the words of God and they've studied the Bible. By the end of the week, their faith is large. Their faith is growing. Their faith, they're making decisions in their life. They're surrendering their life to God. They're making important decisions and coming to Christ either for salvation or just uh, to give their life. Why? Because the more they hear, the more their faith grows. The more you hear, the more your faith grows. You say, preacher, my faith is not what it ought to be. Get in the book more. Start finding some good sermons to listen to. Start. It's produced by hearing. The centurion, when he heard about Jesus, it stirred a faith in him that he could have his servant healed. And the more we hear, the more our faith grows. We need good Bible reading, good Bible preaching. Preaching that helps our faith grow. By the way, if you've got preaching and hearing preaching all the time that doesn't help your faith grow, we need some preaching. I need preaching that helps my faith grow. You know, I know you think I preach to you. I preach to myself. And if it spills over on you, that's good. I'm preaching to myself tonight. I need my faith to grow. It's so easy for us to get stagnant, say, I've, been, I've reached a certain plateau in my faith, but I haven't done anything more by faith. My faith hasn't grown anymore. What well, we need to have so great faith. So it's produced by hearing. By hearing. Number two, it's produced by looking. By looking. Hebrews 12, Wherefore, seeing also we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, 
Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily beset us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. For who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Not just the set of beliefs, but also the faith we have. Looking unto Jesus. Boy, the more we look at him, the more we follow him, the closer we get to him, the more our faith grows. So, I'm going to ask you, what are you doing right now? I have to ask myself to grow your faith. Is your faith more than it was six months ago? Eight months ago. When the pandemic hit, from that moment to this moment, has our faith grown or has it decreased? I'm willing to say that for most of us, it's decreased. We've heard less, we've looked less, we've pulled back away from the things of God, and so our faith is decreased. So we're going to have to exercise and seek God to help our faith grow exceedingly. Because faith... It's like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it becomes. The more we exercise our faith, the more we use our faith, the more we seek that faith, the stronger we come. Now, the problem with people who get to the hospital and for extended periods of time, what happens to their muscles? They get amplified. They just decay to nothing. And so it is with our spiritual faith muscles as well. So, so great faith. Preacher, how can we have so great faith? It's personal. <laughs> I have to seek the faith. I have to let God do a work in me. And it's my faith, not just ours collectively. Number two, faith is produced. Number three, so great faith is propelling. It's propelling. It drives us to do things. It drives us into activity. It drives us into work. That's why I said in, in Luke uh, chapter 7, verse number 3, and when he heard of Jesus... He sent. His faith had him send for Jesus. He went and said, I need my servant healed. I need my slave healed. I care for my servant. I have compassion. And I need that healing for my servant. And his faith propelled him to get Jesus to heal him. So when we have faith, we won't be able to sit still. We have faith that's going to change our life. When we have real, so great faith... It'll push us to action. Jeremiah 20, verse number 9, one of my favorite verses. I like them all, but I like this one. Then said I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. He said, I quit. This old preacher said, I quit. But his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, and I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. He said, there was something inside. He said, that faith he had in God and the Word of God, he said, I could not keep it in. In Acts, 40, back, or Acts 4, verse number 20, For we cannot but speak the things we have seen and heard. They said, the more we've seen, the more we've heard, the more faith we've got. He said, we could not help but speak those things. Hebrews 11 is nothing but by faith they did this, by faith they did that, by faith they did that. The more faith we have, the more it's going to propel us, the more it's going to energize us, the more it's going to drive us, the more it's going to lift us. Can I get a little help tonight? Say amen. Wave a hanky, wave your hand, nod your head, do something. But boy, it's, it, it propels us into action. So great faith. So how's my faith? Well, What's it propelling you to do? What's it, what's it causing you to change in your life? What's it causing you to speak or to say or to do? Next we find that so great faith is pronounced. It's pronounced. It's obvious. It's obvious in our lives. It's pronounced out. It's pronounced by our words. By our words. That's what this centurion, he said, man, his words were, says, you come heal. He said, you come heal my servant. He said, all you have to do is say the word. His so great faith was pronounced. His words made it clear that he had faith in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus hadn't gone to his house yet. He said, just amazed at his words. It's pronounced. It becomes obvious. I think it's there, you know, 2 Corinthians 4.13. We have in the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, therefore have I spoken. So we also believe, and therefore speak. He said, as I believe, I speak. Well, how's our speech patterns? Think back over the last week, and our speech, our words, they tell what we believe. 
They tell the level of faith we have. They tell our walk with God. How much faith we have is manifested by our words. I believe, and therefore I have spoken. You think about your kids, you think about your spouse, you think about your speech at home. Does it show, does it pronounce your faith? Doesn't mean you have to be the Bible thumper all the time at work. Doesn't mean you always have to be talking a religious talk. But in our faith, if the stronger we have in our faith, it will come out in our words. Don't be ashamed of Jesus. Don't be ashamed of his word. Don't be ashamed of his work. Being full of faith, so great faith, it's going to leak out. Just like, well, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Just like when you look at your kids, or never in your life, but sometimes some, some come out your mouth and say, ooh, that shows where my head was. That shows where my heart is. It shows where my faith is. Well, let's fill our heart with that faith, so great faith, that it comes out in our words. It's pronounced in our words. It's pronounced in our works. In our works. Not just in our words, but in our works. The works here, this centurion, not only did he go to Jesus to have him come, but also in his works he says, you just say the word. You just say the word. So our actions, our works will pronounce our faith. He said, I've never seen so great faith. James 2, verse 17. Even so faith if it hath not works, if there's not something manifested in it, if it's not visible, if it's not shown, is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. My works aren't making my faith. My works are a result of my faith. See, people can see our faith by our works. That's what he's saying here. I'll show you my faith by my works. So when you think about that, what does our work show about our faith? You're here tonight on a Wednesday night in the dark underneath the tree getting kind of cold and you're weary and you're tired. That shows something about your faith. But if we've got the nice sunny days and we've got air conditioning, we're inside and all things going, but you say, you know, I just don't think I'll go today. That shows about our faith also when it comes to whether it be offering or obedience or service or forgiveness or joy or peace that we have in this crazy time. That all shows those works, those actions show our faith. So, so great faith is pronounced. It's obvious by our works. So we have to ask ourselves, how's my faith? Well, What's the pronouncement of my faith? What's my words and my works? So great faith. So great faith is perfected. And if you want to add on to that, I can't remember what the notes actually show. Through understanding. Through understanding. Two key pieces of understanding is in this passage that when Jesus saw it, he said, so great faith. So great faith. So here's some understanding. See, there's a maturing of our faith that we can have. A, a perfecting, a maturing, a completing of our faith. First of all, we see in this passage, are you still with me tonight? I'm going kind of fast, but boy, we just need to, to check it. A key to this perfecting of his faith by understanding was by a heart of humility. A heart of humility. Look at verse number 5. And when Jesus entered into Capernaum, there came unto a centurion beseeching him, saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith to him, I will come and heal him. And the, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof. Here's a man who's great authority in the world. Lots of influence. A ruler over a over hundred soldiers or more than that. He, he had great influence, great power. Used to giving orders and having people jump. And in fact, he talks about that. He said, I tell this man to go and he goes. I tell my servant to do it and he does it. He said, I expect that and I demand that and I get that. And yet he says, I'm not worthy. That thou should come under my roof. Talking about Humility. See, our, if I our have great faith in Jesus Christ, 
the key to that maturing so great faith is my humility. And not false humility, not or humility, not humility I put on myself. It's like the lady that went to the preacher and says, I'm the most humble woman in town. He said, You're probably pretty proud of that. She said, I sure am. <laughs> We're not talking about that fake humility. We're talking about when I have so great a faith in Him, one of the ways that matures is when I'm humble before Him. When I see who He is and who I am. That's why it says in James 4, verse number 6, But He, talking about God, giveth more grace. Wherefore He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Listen carefully. We've got to learn to read our Bibles. Did you know that? We miss so much. Is that in your notes, James 4, 6? Oh, okay, let's be sorry. Wherefore he saith, God resists the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore. Again, when you see the word therefore, he's, God's referring to something before that. He giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. So I'm to submit myself therefore to God. Why? Because God gives grace to the humble. So this idea of submitting to God, being humble, and God's grace in my life, boy, that all ties together. Here he said, I'm not worthy. Jesus said, boy, he's got an amazing faith. He's got so great faith. But it was matured, it was perfected in his heart of humility. It was seen by the appropriate supplication. He besought him. He didn't order Jesus. He besought him. He begged him. He asked him. And was seen by his acknowledged station. He said, I'm not worthy. Now, let me help you with something. The devil will try to get you with the wrong kind of humility. The humility he, we see here, he said, where he was not worthy, that was not self-condemning. Sometimes we'll say, well, I feel so humble. Why? Because I just hate myself. I'm just a rotten person. I'm just a miserable person. I think I'll just... No, no, no. That's not the right kind of humility. It's not self-condemning, and it's not self-loathing. But it's just recognizing His position and mine. Who He is and who I am. That's why in Romans 7, 23, He said, but I, Apostle Paul said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O oh, wretched man that I am. That's not self-loathing. That's not tearing himself down. He's just saying, boy, I sure would like to be better. I sure want to be more like my Christ. He said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And we know the next verse says, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So a heart of humility, great, listen, a key to having great, so great faith is being humble before so great a God. Preacher, how can I live my life of faith? Just being humble to God, before God. But here's a key. So one key is a heart of humility. A second key was through honoring authority. Oh, listen, if you've drifted off to sleep, you've got to come back on this. It's this authority. Notice what it says, verse number 8. The spirit answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy, there's his humility, thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man, listen carefully, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. See, the, here's the key, authority, to have us to have the right faith, is understanding authority both ways. He said, I am under authority, and I have authority. I am a man under authority, having soldiers unto me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, to my servant do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard that, he marveled and said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. His faith, listen, and our faith, a key is us understanding and living authority. It's authority. Now again, this authority was both ways. He said, I'm a man under authority and I tell these people to do. So, I don't think this is in your notes, but I've got it down. Who he was under gave him authority to be over. See, he was a soldier over hundreds, but he was not the top soldier. 
He said, I am under authority, which gives me authority to tell others. So who he was under gave him authority to be over. That's true in our Christian life. That's true in any life. Husbands and wives. Husband is supposed to have authority over the wife. She's to submit. But who gives him, the husband, the authority? God, because he is under the authority of God. So as the husband is underneath the authority of God, that gives him authority then to have authority over his wife, if you will. Children, parents, you're to have to be under authority of God so we can have our children under our authority. Same thing in a church for members and pastors. So who he was under gave him authority to be over. So before we try to have authority over somebody else, we better make sure we are under authority. The problem in our homes, the problem in our churches, the problem in the workplace is the fact, the problem with our faith is that we are not understanding authority. We are out from underneath authority and we try to exert authority ourselves. In fact, Jesus said to Pilate in John 19.10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee and the power to release thee? Jesus answered, said, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivereth me unto thee hath he greater sin. So the key to great faith is understanding authority. Here we go. What helps make my faith so great, not I'm saying it is, but what would make it that way, if I can understand I'm under His authority. The more I understand His authority, the greater my faith can be. When I don't understand that I'm under His authority, and He is the authority, when I don't acknowledge that and don't dwell and understand the idea that I'm under His authority, I haven't got that. I won't have so great faith. But the more I understand His authority over me, I can have greater faith. So our faith then is matured and perfected when we understand God has authority, listen, over everything. Aren't you glad God has authority over everything? Well, you say it doesn't look like it is. Oh, He's got authority. He permits that, just like with Job and everything else. He permits those things to chasten us, to build us, to guide us, giving the free will. But He has authority over everything. He has authority over people. He has authority over powers. He has pow authority over the weather. He has authority over death. Amen. And so when I say He's got that authority, I understand authority. That's what the centurion says. I understand authority. He said, I am under authority. They tell me. And and I understand giving authority. He says, so I see that you've got the authority over this sickness. Jesus, come heal my servant. So you and I can have our faith built and growing as we understand authority. The problem is when we get rebellious against God, we wonder why our faith isn't very strong. When we rebel against the authority of his word and we rebel against the authority of God, we say, well, I don't know what's why my faith is so weak. No, so great faith comes from great understanding of authority of God. So our faith grows because we have understand God's authority over all things, and our faith grows when we understand God's authority over me over me. So, but preacher, I just don't have any faith God's going to take care of the pandemic. God has authority over germs. God's not afraid of any germs. So when I understand that authority, I say, okay, that mean I shouldn't wash my hands or gargle and brush my teeth and do all the, I'm not saying, I'm just saying I can have faith because he's got authority over it. He's got authority over me. He's got authority over the germs. He's got authority over the policy. He's got authority. Jesus says, I'll come here. He says, no need. Because he said, I understand authority. He said, boy, that's great faith. Do we understand authority? Are we fighting authority? Do we reject authority? Do we fight authority? By humility. By authority, very quickly, by honing a principle. By honing a principle. There's a principle in this that really is the pinnacle of faith, if you will. Notice what he says in verse number 8. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy. There's a humility. He says, no, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only. What's the principle? The word only. In other words, I only need God's word. Just the word. 
He said, you don't have to prove anything else to me. You say it and it's so. You say it and it's done. You say it and I believe it. I'm just counting on the word. Boy, the pinnacle of faith, when it comes down, we hone that principle, the word only. But I don't see it happening like I thought it should. The word only. But it just doesn't make sense like what I would do. The word only. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And he says, the word only. He says, you don't, it's not your magic powder that you're going to do. No, it's just the word. The word. Jo, uh, Joshua 21, 45. There fail not aught, means nothing, of any good thing which the Lord hath spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. He says, he, he spoke it and he says, not a bit of it failed. In 2 Corinthians uh, one twenty, For all promises of God in him are yea and a in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. Oh, there's a whole message in that. The promises of God in him, Christ, are yea and an amen, amen, unto the glory of God by us. I'm glad God's word is enough. See, the pinnacle of faith, we get to the place where it's God's word's enough. God said it, I'm just going to believe it. God said it, I'm going to act upon it. God said it, I'm going to follow it. God said it, I'm going to live my life by it. God said it, it may not make sense to me right now. It may not be panning out like I thought, but the word only. Wow. So great faith. Comes from an understanding of humility, a heart of humility. Honoring authority. Catch that? Honoring authority. He says, you don't need to come. I'm under authority. And I give authority. I understand that. I'm honoring your authority over disease. Just say it. Just say it. And then honing the principle, the word's enough. Lastly, we find, so great faith is rewarded proportionally. Proportionally. Verse 13. And Jesus saith unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so it be done unto thee. As you've believed, so it be done unto thee. Matthew, uh, Matthew 9, 28. And when he was coming to the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said to them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yea, Lord. He touched their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. In Matthew 15, 28. Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee, even as thou will. Matthew 17, 20, Jesus saith unto them, Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Jesus makes it clear that we are rewarded, our faith is rewarded, if you will, the results, if you will, come of our faith proportional to our faith. He said, the more you believe, the more you have. Don't look at me like, I'm not going charismatic, I'm just saying what Jesus said. He said, according to your faith, he says it's going to be healed. To the blind people, according to your faith, be it so. To the woman, according to your faith, be it so. So I want God to use me. I want God to do some things in my life. I want, let's have so great faith. I want some so great things done. Then we need so great faith. Well, I just want little things done. Well, then just have little faith. So tonight we look at this so great faith. How's your faith? Is it growing? Is it great, or is it decaying, or is it dying? Our prayer ought to be, Lord, increase my faith. And then let, let's exercise, and let God exercise our faith muscles. Or is Jesus marveling at our lack of faith? He marveled, so great faith. Does he look at us and say, I'm marveling. They've got the Holy Spirit. They've got the book. They've got the miracles. They see what I've done. But they still won't believe. So great faith. Let's bow our heads, please.